Welcome to the Sirius Seminar for February 4th, uh, 2009. It's our pleasure today to welcome Cassio Goldschmidt, who is uh, with the uh, Product Security Division at Symantec and uh, has a uh, well known or long established and well known history in computer security. In particular, you will find him as, as one of these. Uh, white hats who frequently are finding where there are problems, where there are vul vulnerabilities. And uh, uh, Dr. Goldschmidt has a, or actually not doctor, it's, uh, he has three degrees, but that third one is not actually a PhD. He has a bachelor's from, uh, I won't try to say, Catolica Pontifica in Brazil. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, before obtaining a master's in CS, and then an MBA from uh, UC, uh, USC, USC. Mm -hmm. USC. And uh, so, proud to introduce uh, Cassio Goldschmidt. Thanks. If you ever build or use applications that run on a network such as the internet, you are going to be attacked. From a user perspective, what means is that all the assets that you have in your computer are at stake. For example, I'm sure a lot of you do online banking using the internet. I'm sure a lot of you do your taxes on the internet. So that can be a real problem. The other thing is, as software engineers, your reputation is also at stake whenever you have a problem in your application that is running on the internet. If you have a vulnerability, your customers may look at that and may never come back to your site. They may never use your products again, which ultimately can uh, damage or, uh, your company revenue. In this talk, I'll be presenting some of the problems that we see um, with application and all the vulnerabilities that we see today, the most common ones, and most importantly of all, what we can do to prevent them and prevent all the greed that would come from doing an application that doesn't work or work malicious for some reason. The first kind of attack we're going to see is actually cross-site scripting. I'm pretty sure that some of you already heard about it. Cross-site scripting is quite an uh, interesting attack because a lot of people think because a server is vulnerable, you're going to attack the server. And that's not the case. You're actually attacking the client. The server is vulnerable, however, you are attacking the client. Here's an example of cross-site scripting, what I call cross-site scripting 101. What you see here is an attacker which knows about the server which is vulnerable. The attacker could go and attack the server and inject some type, uh, type of script in that server, and the script would be redirected to his browser and executed. In other words, he could attack himself, which is not a lot of fun. So, what this attacker can do instead is actually send a message to the victim with some really interesting topics, something that would coerce the victim to open the attachment, such as click here to win a million dollars. Well, a million dollars, you know, perhaps they could have some use for that. Let me click in this uh, email. This email comes with a special URL. This URL has the address of the server, plus some data that actually falls out of bounds from being data and becomes a script once it's processed by the vulnerable server. So what just happens is once the server is actually processing this data, it embeds the script in the page and serves back to the client. Suddenly, this data that was sent by the attacker becomes legit and it's part of the data that is in the web page. The client executes, and in this case of my example, what it says is, send your cookie to the attacker. So here's the cookie, goes to the attacker, and once you have somebody's cookie, you can impersonate the person if you want. And that's one of the ways you can do a cross that scripting attack. Once I show the slide, a lot of people think, okay, I got it. So you can steal cookies, and that's really bad, and that's why you have to protect it. Well, there's a lot more than you can do. Consider what happened here during the presentation uh, election campaign. The site you see here is called votehillary.org. 
Well, this site had a cross-site script uh, vulnerability. And what Obama supporters did is actually uh, change the way the site works in order to redirect to somebody who they think it was a better, uh, a better candidate and now are present. Um, another thing you can do with cross-site scripting is basically deface some page. Here's a real website of a bank in Italy. And you can see in this website that you have a place to, you know, just like other websites, to enter your username and password. This site had a cross-site script vulnerability that somebody actually was able to change things a little bit. What you see in this slide is actually a page where you would put your uh, PIN number, you would put your code, and it really uses, you know, all this fake information uh, is really coming from the, um, from the bank website. So if you look at the URL, it's really hard to look here, but it's HTTPS and it's coming from the real bank. So your padlock in the bottom of the browser is on. Any user who clicks on this thing would swear that this is the real, uh, a real page server served by the bank server. And in fact it is, but it has some content which is malicious. Once you click the confirmation button here, it's probably going to send the information to the attacker. So as for cross-site scripting, there are three types of attacks. One of them and the one we've been talking about is type number one. In other words, uh, it's non-persistent web data. You send as a URL, and then once you send as a URL, uh, the person has to be coerced to actually click on that URL, and you can do a bunch of things, such as the potential damage could be to steal cookies or to modify web content, as we just saw in the slides. Type zero is kind of interesting, and a lot of times people overlook this kind of attack. It's against the local desktop. And people think, okay, um, HTML, local desktop, I don't get it. Well, basically a lot of the applications you use today, they have HTML and they are based on HTML. Some examples, if you use all, any IAM client, you see all the smiley faces, all that rendering is done most of the times by Internet Explorer. You see interfaces such as uh, Install Shield, VMware, Norton Internet Security, they all use HTML in order to do uh, that interface. Uh, WinApp is another application that uses HTML. If you can't get a cross-site scripting going on in one of those applications, you pretty much own the desktop. So it's really, really a powerful way of uh, leveraging cross-site scripting. Uh, by the way, help uh, systems in Windows they're all based in HTML. The CM, uh, CHM files are actually HTML. Type 2 attack is actually with persistent data. What you see usually in, for example, uh, guest books, where you can leave a message. If you could break out of bounds and actually put some script on that message, then it would be persistent for the next person who actually looks at the page. And that's one of the most interesting attacks, because once the, the data is saved on the page, then you have the opportunity to do things like cross-site script worms, which we've seen uh, a couple years ago uh, in MySpace. Somebody was able to create a worm called Sammy is my hero. Uh, 